Thank you everyone for coming. If you are able to show us your face, we would love to see you. Um, welcome to the third of our CATS Innovation webinar series. My name is E. L. and I work with Dan and with Mike at Penn on the CATS Innovation um, work. I just wanted to remind everyone that this is a, the next step. We've been building on what we started at HIGA this winter and are excited to continue through April and through the end of May with five webinar series. Um, they're designed to create space for you guys to think together, to innovate together, collaborate with each other on and off the screen. Um, and we want to welcome everyone returning for their third webinar and all new faces um, that are here today. You are welcome to email me at ykeller, K-E-L-L-E-R, at penphilel.org. If you did not receive information on the last two sessions, um, because they are coming up and we would love to see you there. Two really great speakers mm -hmm. after Dan. So I'm going to introduce Dan quickly. Uh, Dan is the inaugural Chief Innovation Officer for Hillel International, where he directs the Office of Innovation, a lab of new ideas and initiatives for young Jews. I know many of you heard from Dan at Higa and are excited to hear more, so I will turn it over. Thanks, Dan. All right, thanks guys. Happy uh, Lagba Omer. We're definitely gonna say a few words about Lagba Omer uh, towards the end of our session. Um, but I hope everyone received a copy of the notes. Um, uh, is that the case, Yael and Julie, that we sent out the notes and the leads list to everyone? So I'm just gonna share uh, with you guys um, what I call how to organize a community soup to nuts. And this is basically uh, one approach to community organizing. Community organizing is one of these areas that like Jews are very interested in and people become extremely uptight and ideological and didactic about it. Um, I don't share any of those uh, predilections. I think there isn't a particularly right way to organize a community. I don't uh, at all purport to have the answers for how a community should be organized, uh, but I am gonna share with you what our method in OOI is. And for full transparency, the method that I'm describing is based on um, my experience working in the labor movement, particularly for the hotel and restaurant employees union, um, what's called Unite Here. And that method is uh, based on the farm workers community organizing model. Um, so uh, before I dive in uh, to this uh, approach, any questions, comments, thoughts, or reactions just on that, Hakdama, uh, that, that intro? All right, I've got my eyes on the chat here, so feel free to type or dump anything into the chat you like or to uh, unmike or unmute rather and get in on it. Um, so the model that we're gonna describe is uh, relationship-based and on what's called lean startup. Now some of you have probably heard of like the lean startup ideology that folks are into. Um, anyone wanna raise their hand if they've never heard of lean startup and it's just like, what on earth is that? So Esther Reed, anyone else just like, you know, what on earth, Miriam Ross, lean startup. It starts a book by a guy named Eric Ries, who's trying to describe how uh, businesses in the tech sector are different from other kinds of businesses. And the main difference is that instead of coming up with a 25 page business plan and five or 10 year projections in a lean startup approach, you try and create a basic model or it's called an MVP, minimum viable product or project um, that describes what you're doing. It's like an, a living, breathing example of what it is you want to build. So when Facebook started, uh, I was in college and Facebook was a thing for kids at Harvard and then it was a thing for kids at Harvard and Yale and it was a thing for kids in the Ivy League and then for colleges everywhere and then for people on earth. So the minimum Bible project of Facebook is just the kids at Harvard looking at each other uh, while they're students um, and then it grows out from there. So the approach that we're doing, uh, a minimum Bible project imagines you're going to build a minimum viable version of your community and iterate it or change it very, very quickly from there. So let's get started. Uh, first thing you want to figure out is um, what is your N? And that's just jargon for how many people are you actually trying to organize? If we were doing a um, city council race in Savannah, Georgia, or in Tuscaloosa, or Detroit, or in Buffalo, um, or if we were running for Congress or Senate, the first thing you have to know is how many people are going to vote. Um, if you can't actually define the universe of voters, it's very hard to organize anything. Could you imagine going into a congressional midterm and someone's like, so, so how many people are like vote in this district? And you're like, actually, I have no idea. I've never thought about how many people live in the district. Um, in Hillel, we notoriously lie about how many students there are on campus. Our numbers are, are overwhelmingly bogus and made up. Um, I know that because I've actually made up some of those numbers myself. 
um, when you go to like the Reform Jewish magazine of the list of the top 20 Jewish college campuses, I don't know if there's any evidence that supports any of that stuff. Like for years, I would say, um, oh, there's 6,000 students at NYU and there's 4,000 at UCLA. There's just no evidence supporting either of those claims when we put them out there. They were just wild guesses. So the first thing I would ask you is, do you know exactly how many Jewish students are on your campus? Uh, I'm just going to pause. Questions, comments, thoughts, or reactions to that. Do you know how many are? Like how many people are you trying to organize? Esther Reed, looks like you want to jump in. Yeah, um, we had a demographer on our board of directors who did a demographic study, and that's how we came up with our number. And uh, by demographic study, what did they do? Um, well, since we're the State University of New Jersey, and at the time, 90% of our students were from the state of New Jersey, he was able to do some calculations on how many Jews reside in New Jersey, and assuming that 90% of um, New Jersey, 90% of the students at Rutgers uh, attend, uh, come from the state of New Jersey, he was able to figure out what the um, statistics would be for the Jewish population. So he basically estimated that the Rutgers population would mirror the population of New Jersey. 90% of it would. 90% of it would, okay. Anyone else have a clear number of how many Jews are on your campus that's evidence-based? Well, so I just said something in the chat, but like for us at least like there, I don't wanna say there's no way, but we've tried and worked with, and I don't really see a path to determine the exact number. Like WashU doesn't collect that information. We aren't, we're only able to determine the number of students that self-report to us, not the number of students there actually are. So we make some guesstimates, but like, so I totally understand that it's really important to know the number, but like when we're not able to get that number, like how do we, what do we do then, I guess? That's a great question. So I'll, Again, I don't purport to have all the answers here. I can just tell you what no, I- No, of course, um, sorry. I'm just like, I totally agree with that. I'm just like, a lot of us can't, can't, can't. like I hate saying can't, but it's okay, not, so not what super I, feasible. What I try to do in that case is just, um, let's figure out, as opposed to saying we can't, let's figure out what, what is possible. So I'll tell you uh, two things that we've done. Um, I used to organize workers in a hotel into a union. So some hotels have like two or 3,000 people working for them, right? And um, the hotel, like the Hyatt company, will never give you a list of names of employees uh, because they don't ever want to do that. They don't want them to join a union. So to figure out how to get a list of people when they don't want to give it to you. So uh, that was a skill we developed. At NYU, one of the things that I did is a private university, right, that does not want to report anything to anyone. We painstakingly built relationships with people in the admissions office over years so that they would come to us and ask us questions like, what the heck is an Eruv? And why are the kids in Miami asking me if we have one? Or how kosher is the kosher food? These are like people that go out and sell NYU around the country, right? And then finally, I don't know, it was maybe like after two and a half years, we casually asked for the list of accepted incoming freshmen, and we got it one year. Um, and then once we got it, we just made it into precedent. We said, oh, you know how last year you gave us the list of accepted incoming freshmen? We'd love to send them a welcome letter for Hillel that you approve ahead of time or something like that. And they said, sure. And of course, we'll invite everyone to Hillel. That summer, we took the list and we got an intern, this is old school, to go through every single name and determine if there was any possibility the person could be Jewish. So like if the person's name is like, you know, uh, Mohammed bin Ifta and is from Riyadh, chances are that person is not Jewish. Like, could be, but, and we're not doing science here, but we tried to figure it out. Or if the person's name is like Christian McJesus and they're at the Evangelical Academy of Louisiana, and we had people with names like that, we excluded them. Uh, we then took everyone who was a potential Jewish person and we ran them through Facebook, through Google, um, every social media platform that we had, and we determined we had 986 people that we thought were potentially Jewish. In the first year, we found an additional like 57 people who didn't come through our screen, and we got it increasingly accurate year after year. So we started with our N uh, by literally just going name by name by name by name through every single freshman uh, that we had in the incoming class, and then did that year after year, and we used that as our basis for our N. So the most important thing is to have some hard number that's an N, and the N just means universe of potential people you're organizing. If you don't have it, it's kind of all for, it's watery thereafter. Uh, let me pause there. Any questions, uh, reactions, or thoughts on that basic idea of getting your list? Well, I have a question. Sure. So um, you're talking about being at NYU and having that as your N? Yeah. 
I thought you said before that you thought there were, I don't know, like 6,000 students at NYU, and now you're saying there were like 900 something? So to be clear, the first number I said, 6,000, was a complete makeup number. Right, uh, and the 900 was actual names. Of freshmen. Ah, uh, freshmen. And NYU, recall, doesn't run um, four classes. It runs uh, four years, and then it has universities that are outside of the country. So it was the number of freshmen that we had, and we uh -huh. built out from there. So there are different ways to do that. Um, you can have people opt into a list. You can try and select. You can use the common application, create a website. But at some point, you need an N. So once yep. you get an N, you establish something called a leads list. I think I shared it with you guys. It's a spreadsheet that looks like this. Um, everyone should have a copy of the leads list. This is like basic political organizing 101, which is essentially you assign a number to everyone on your list. And a one is a person who's a name. So if someone says to you, um, Alana Greenberg um, goes to uh, Ohio State or Rutgers or MIT or, or Wellesley or something, you say, okay, that's a one. I have a name. So the first thing that you try and do when you're organizing is populate the list of names that you're trying to reach. If you don't know the names of the people you're trying to reach, it's going to be very hard to reach them, right? Or to ever have any idea if you're being held accountable. Um, so what we tend to do, and again, I'll just say what I tend to do, so I'm not going to ascribe this to you, but what I tend to do when I was working on campus was just lie all the time and be like, oh, there's 40 people in the room. I don't know. They're all great. And they'd be like, oh, could you tell me the names of the 40 people? No, nope, can't do it. So I have no idea if the number is actually accountable. It's a guesstimate. But what you want to do is figure out if you were organizing the freshman incoming class at um, Loyola or at MIT or at Rutgers, what are the names of every single person you want to reach? So in the same way the Republican or Democratic Party wants to know the names of every potential voter who's registered in District 22, you want to know the name of every single potential freshman who's coming into your campus. We start with freshmen because you retain a community better if you organize younger people than older people because the older people leave. And freshmen really just need like 18 months. And uh, after 18 months, they just assume that that's the way things are on campus, right? So you start with them and you can get the freshmen either by creating a website, doing a mailing, getting people to opt in, building out from Facebook, but you want to populate a list of ones, which are names. Twos are people you've made initial contact with or in conversation. That can be through um, emails or through social media or whatever it is, or person to person. And a three is a user or a repeat user. So a three is someone who has come in person to whatever it is you're trying to do and has repeated doing that. So your goal is to get more threes from your ones and twos. So your first step, populate the list. And then in your staff meeting week to week, what you're going to do is say, okay, Joe on the team, how many ones are on your list? And Joe will say, I have 62 ones. Okay, how many can you convert to threes? Which is like, how many people can you actually meet, contact, and recruit and bring into something? It's not a perfect model, but it's as close as we can come up with to make people accountable for the art and science of talking to folks. Let me just take a pause right there for reactions, questions, comments, or thoughts on that. The, um, the concept of the leads list, like on the one hand, this is like very cool to see kind of for the first time and also very familiar to some of the ways that we try to use reach and whatever other programs we're using. Um, maybe that's just a comment, but I'm wondering if, uh, Dan, if you or anyone else like has, has done this with some of the other technology that you might be using, whether it's reach or Salesforce or, or whatever else. And, and having that like mesh well with the technology that we're using. Absolutely. So we do it with um, Salesforce. Um, and Salesforce can also generate regular reports for you. So like for our um, staff meeting, like you'll see like our dashboards come up and we can automatically um, generate reports for everything that's coming in. Um, you know, like who is a one this week, who's a three this week, who's a two. Um, etc. Um, so it plays very, very nicely with Salesforce. I can't in any way speak to what happens on Little Green Light because I, I don't use that technology. Um, but for Salesforce, a leads list is an essential um, tool that we use. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? I just want to add that on our campus, we use Swipe and you can use it for that too. Great. 
Um, I'm going to share with you um, some graphics of what this looks like in Salesforce. I'm just pulling it up right now. Um, these are from like Hunter College. Um, so I'm going to make a copy of this and share it with you guys right now. So, you know, Hunter is partnered with the Office of Innovation and we work very closely with their um, campus and we've redesigned um, some of like the models that we use based on the experience at Hunter. But I'm going to share um, just a visual of what their dashboard uh, looks like. So let me publish this to the web and I will get you the uh, doc on that right now. Anyone else want to weigh in? Okay. On, oh, yeah. on my campus, we do use LGL, and as far as like our leads list, we do have like a list of all the students who like have self-identified themselves as Jewish, or we've met them in one way, shape, or form, and we have their information. And how we work on making them into twos and threes is we can actually create tasks for each other. So I'll meet with someone, and I'll be like, okay, like I've met you. So we've had that initial contact and then to get them to come back, I'll like assign them to another staff member and be like, here's this person that I met. I think the two of you would really vibe. So like now you go out and kind of create that more developed connection. Yes. Yes. That's absolutely right. Um, so there's a way to personalize this on every campus. I can get you guys copies of like what the office of, of innovation dashboard looks like for this. Um, so we try and develop, ones, twos, and threes, and move people on. So once you get your leads list, one of the questions that people often ask is, how do you actually get people to sit down with you? So um, you can email them, and we try and use three principles and some techniques. So the three basic principles that we always use in contacting folks are personal, ongoing, not creepy. Absolutely no contacts that are general, which is, hey, everybody, come hookah in the sukkah, all Jews, holla back, chocolate seder, right? So those are general. Um, non-personal. So we only contact people in a personal way, which is me as an individual, Dan is going to contact Yael as an individual, whether that's face-to-face -face or through social media. Ongoing, if you contact a person, you have to be willing to keep up that relationship as long as need be until the person uh, opts out, gets handed off, graduates, moves on, etc. So no one and dones. And the third is you can't be creepy. No late night texting, uh, no, you know, dude, uh, skulking girl that kind of thing none of that right so nothing that would constitute creepiness so we try and use what we call witty sensibility which is a low pressure uh, tongue-in-cheek form of communication uh, that's personal ongoing and continuous you contact a person and you're looking for some way to deepen the relationships i just want to share with you a couple of the moves that we've done a classic way is to say we're surveying all the freshmen at such and such university so that we can get a better sense of what kind of jewish life they have or what their experience is like. Now the survey is not like I'm emailing it to you. It's five or six questions that you would ask in a one-on-one -on, -one on a piece of paper. And I'm using that old technology purposefully to force someone into a conversation. So if you say to someone, do you want to have a cup of coffee or do you want to get together? The answer is often no. But if you say to someone, I'm doing a survey and I would love to get your feedback on how to change this community. The answer is often, oh, I might be able to do that. And the questions in the survey are like, Tell me how you came to Rutgers or MIT. Uh, what brought you to LMU? Uh, what are your biggest hopes and aspirations here? What kind of career are you going into? Tell me what Jewish life feels like. I'm going to give you a list of adjectives. Will you, will you tell me what sounds most like the Jewish community here? Uh, what holds you back? You know, general questions. But that's a lead off for a conversation. And if you're good, when the person's talking, you'll say, oh, you know, it's so interesting that, that uh, you're from Memphis because, you know, my aunt is from Memphis and I love Graceland. And you begin the process of, building up a relationship with that individual through using the survey. If the survey doesn't work, you can up the stakes of it and say, you know, um, we're, we're in the running for a major investment. Now, who isn't in the running for a major investment? That, that statement doesn't actually mean anything. But we're in the running for like a major investment on campus, and we need to have a good understanding of what Jewish life could look like here to secure that investment. Um, so I'd really love to sit down with you for 20 minutes and get your survey feedback on how this goes. And that survey tool is a way to essentially interview uh, or begin conversations with scores and scores of people. Um, I've seen that done at UCLA, at Occidental, and at NYU, where we literally surveyed hundreds of people to get their feedback. And it's basically a way to get people into the engagement pipeline. Um, questions, comments, thoughts on that? Dan, I think Talia Rodwin oh, has a question. Yeah. yeah. Is that you, Talia? Go ahead, jump in. No, that's not me, but I saw someone ask that question. I was going to say, I had a question. Oh, yeah. 
That's I wrote that in the box. Sorry, I can't yeah. turn the video on right now, but you guys can hear me, right? Yeah. Um, it's just a question about what you're saying about ongoing. You were like, there's no one and done. So like when you message people in these like individualized contacts, do you like really try to persist with those or like at what point? And this could be also for everyone, but like if you're really trying to prove like we care about you ongoing contact, at what point does that cross into creepy? Or I'm just curious what people think about that. For us, we don't reach out to them more than twice without a response. So if we try and they don't respond and then we again and then they don't respond, then we don't, then we like wait, we don't or we'll revisit it another time. For us, I don't know what Dan or anyone else thinks. Yeah, anyone else for me on that? I mean, I, I think like creepy is sort of, you know it when you see it, but uh, it depends on your campus what, what constitutes creepiness. But like, I'll tell you for me, like I would never text a student. Um, I don't uh, reach out to people of the opposite sex except during daylight hours. Like I wouldn't do that. Like I wouldn't message anyone at 1 a.m. Like there's certain sort of guidelines that I have for myself, but uh, anyone else wanna weigh in on that? Okay. Um, so a few more things just related to that. Um, so can I ask a question? Yeah, I had a question. Okay, yeah, yeah ask. Um, Cause I'm at a Hillel right now that is vastly understaffed based on the number of Jewish students that we have. Um, and, you know, in order to get like a clean cross section of these sorts of survey interactions that are in person, um, the only way <laughs> that I can conceive of to do that is to get our student leadership involved in having those conversations. So I'm curious if anybody has done that, how it's worked, how you got student leaders on board with like doing it well. Um, and, and like also that's very within our particular ethos of the way that like our students want to interact with things is they want to be very involved. What campus are you at? I'm at uh, SUNY Binghamton. Right. So. Um, 3,700 Jews, a staff of four. Yeah, how do you know it's 3,700? That's the nearest information that we've gotten from admissions. Okay, so um, what I would do, and I can just tell you, like um, when we've run peer-to-peer uh, -peer engagement fellowships like CEI and PNEI, I always train CEIers to do this, to mm -hmm. run a survey as the first thing they do because they usually need some kind of a gimmick in order to get out and have coffee with people. Mm -hmm. so the very first thing I do is I say, go survey 10 people, uh, find them wherever you need to sit down, meet them, survey them. And then we role play survey conversations in small group meetings with students and the students give solutions based feedback to each other. Solutions based feedback means not saying what you did wrong, but how could you do it better? Um, mm -hmm. And how could you change it for the positive so that they have the experience in a kind of theater lab format of doing this in front of their peers and getting uh, solutions or any feedback so they can do it better. So I've, I've trained a lot of students to do that. Cool. Um, I have a question. So um, I'm curious if this is something that you do every year. Like, I love this idea so much. I'm curious if like we start every year with like, oh, we're doing a survey of our students and after a few years, they're gonna be like, they're always doing the survey. Like, what is this? Like, is it real? So like, I'm curious if you do it every year, if people don't mind or if it's just different people or kind of if it's something that's done once or twice or I'm just like curious what your feedback might be on that. My, my, you need a gimmick to talk to a lot of people. If anyone has a better gimmick than a survey, I would gladly take it. I've done things- Or we could just be like, oh, every year we survey. That's what we do. Like. You, you could. I mean, I've done things where like I've done a bike-a-thon and I've been like, um, I'm trying to raise a hundred bucks in a bike-a-thon and I'm just going to have people donate one dollar to my bike-a-thon and while you're donating, I'm going to get you in a conversation. Like you just need mm. some gimmick in order to get lots of people. You could stand in the street corner and just go find people, but whatever will get folks in the pipeline. Um, and the key idea here is uh, pipeline or what we call an engagement funnel. Um, is anyone not familiar with the idea of an engagement or a sales funnel? Raise your hand if you've never heard of a funnel. Yeah, okay. So if you picture a funnel, right, it is thick at the top and narrow at the bottom. So what a funnel means is the number of people at the top are those folks that have actually encountered your product or thing. Like everybody has heard of Budweiser beer, but not everyone actually buys Budweiser beer. So some people buy it and then don't ever buy it again. And some people repeat users and then some people buy it every week when you get down to the bottom. And the question that funnel is where do people fall off? So if you meet 200 people at the beginning of the year, that's the top of your funnel, right? But if only 20 are actively engaged with you, responding, participating, doing some behavior week on week or month on month, that's what your actual 
uh, user group is. And so what you're constantly trying to figure out is, how do I make the funnel less wide and more narrow? I want to keep everybody that I meet. In business, that's called the sales funnel, right? So what you're wondering is what happens at every step of the process that makes people fall off? Does that make sense? Right, so one way you can figure that out is called a listening tour. So if, let's say you bring in 100 people at MIT uh, in the first week because you run a good, uh, oh, someone found a really cool image of the sales funnel that just got posted in the chat. Okay, so you, uh, you get 100 people in your welcome week because you know how to run a good welcome week operation but by october uh at the end of october by halloween you're only interacting with 20 people regularly so there's 80 people that you lost in the sales funnel so what you do is go back on a listening tour which is kind of like a survey and you say we're going to reach back out to every single one of those 80 people and say hey i met you at the beginning of the year i haven't seen you since i want to know is everything okay what's going on in your life is there anything that we can do to improve what we're doing here? Essentially, you're getting user feedback. Like if you rank a, a product really badly in a website and they email you afterwards, they're like, oh my God, you ranked us really badly. What happened? Right? So that's what you're trying to figure out. So you go on a listening tour. So if you have CEIRs, engagement staff, or interns, what you want to imagine is like in the arc of the year, people are going to reach their first 40% in the first like 60 days of work. And then 60 to 90 days into work, you're going to prepare your staff <clears throat> to go back on a listening tour and figure out who else they met so they can widen out that funnel and not lose so many people at every segment of the operation. Does that make sense? Questions on that just before we go forward? Okay. When you're meeting people, uh, there are two techniques that we use. I'm in the, in the notes. I'm in section 3.3 here called shipping the calendar and the arc of development. Shipping the calendar is slang for basically saying um, whatever the user wants, we're already doing that. Let me say that again. Whatever the user wants, we're already doing that. Classic mistake in Hillel is you get a student interested in something and the student, and you say like, students like, oh, I'd really like to um, study mysticism. I don't know, I'm making this up. And you say, oh, let's have a meeting about how to plan a mysticism class. No, right? Because no one wants to go to a meeting. So instead what you say is, it so happens we have a mysticism group. That's incredible. I have shipped the calendar, meaning like the calendar already exists. It's already in the mail. It's arriving at you. We're not going to have a meeting to create the calendar. So shipping the calendar is you say, I already have a mysticism group. In fact, it meets on Wednesdays and I'd love for you to be there. And they're like, I can't do Wednesdays. Oh, we were thinking about moving it anyway. What day can you do? Thursday. Great. The mysticism group meets on Thursdays. I'll see you this Thursday and I'll bring two people with me. It's a little more bold, but it actually gets things done. If you get people into the process of planning and meetings, they essentially begin to see themselves as bureaucrats, not as doers. And what you want to do is create a sense of excitement that whatever people are looking for, that's happening in a community. Now, usually when you share this idea with people, Esther, one sec, usually when you share this idea with people, or particularly Hill professionals, they come up with 50 reasons why they could never do this in their head. So like, I could never do this because what if they're into something I'm not into? I could never do this because I'm so, I could never, I could never, I agree, we could never do it, granted. So I would just encourage people to say like, could you do it ever? And let me just pause right there. Esther, what do you say? So I'm trying to figure this out. Is this total bullshit? Like, oh, you're interested in that. We already have mysticism class. Well, no, we don't. But suddenly you're gonna scramble and put together a class and advertise it and hope that the person you're meeting with isn't the only one who walks in the room. Like, I don't understand what you're trying to, is that what you're saying? Or are you saying like legit, you already had planned a mysticism class? Um, I, neither. I'm actually saying neither of those things. So okay. Back to um, uh, yeah, there are notes, uh, Gabriel. They they got sent out. So the shipping of the calendar. If you go to number two, which is minimum viable project, right? So if someone says I'm interested in Talmud or mysticism, what does it take to actually have a mysticism class? It takes me and that person and a third. That's it. That's the class. It's a minimum viable product. If they like it, we'll iterate it. We'll grow it. What we don't want to do is plan, create a flyer, get a group, ask for some funding. Discuss. That just slows your momentum. By the time you do anything with that, like it's already done. All you've taught the students is that they're a bureaucrat at a federation as opposed to a doer. So if someone says to me, I like mysticism, I'd say, oh, you know what? We've got a mysticism class. I'd be like, really? Be like, yeah, I've always been trying to build one. Now I have the perfect excuse. You know what? Our first class is meeting next week. I have a friend who's going to learn with us. We're starting it there. Now the mysticism class exists. We've shipped the calendar. 
So is that um, bullshit? Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm joining by phone, so you know my video, but it's Sarah Ader. Um, how does that work when we're dealing with um, engagement interns or students? Can they do the same thing? If they're good, yeah. Um, Ariel Brody, who's now at Hunter, I think we must have done this 30 times together at NYU. Um, so like, if a person's like, I really want a men's group or a women's group, you know, I, I don't know. And so you sort of like feel out what they might be potentially interested in. They indicate an interest. And then rather than um, leaving and saying, I'll get back to you or let's plan it, you say, oh, that exists at such and such a time. Why? Because I just made it exist because that's what I do in a community. And then if they say, oh, well, I can't do that, they say, okay, so we'll move it to the other time. So we've left the encounter, we've cut out three planning steps and we've moved from one-on-one -on -one into minimum viable product very, very quickly. It's how you get momentum in a community. Um, so so my question is, so the, the students themselves can do that if I, right, I run this interface fellowship and they're speaking to students as if they're then grabbing their friends from everywhere to make sure that everyone who says they're interested in some sort of event finds that it already exists and the students are responsible for, for creating those things as if they already exist? It's, I think we're getting a little hung up on the word already exist. What I'm trying to say is that if a person expresses an interest, you want to capitalize on that interest and turn it into a solid living thing, even if that's just you and them doing it together. And by calling it a thing and putting it on the calendar immediately or saying it's already on the calendar, so to speak, um, you're giving it a great deal of momentum. It doesn't mean you need to chase down every dumb idea that's out there, but it's a technique that can be used. So this isn't a halacha. This isn't like always do this, right? It's like, this is a technique that you can employ. So if I meet some people and they're like, I really, um, I really like the outdoors. You say, that's great. We've got an outdoor group. We're hiking this, uh, this weekend. I'll bring two people. You're there and now it exists, right? So like, it's a technique for organizing a community. Does that make sense? Yes. Sure. <laughs> sort of. Not so much. What's unclear? Then it's fine. We can, if, if I have more questions, I'll, I'll reach out to you after. You got it. Okay. Um, once you've done that process of like met with lots and lots of people, um, once you've met lots and lots of people, you figure out really quickly that like students are not so different from each other. There are like five or six themes that keep popping up. Like you're really not going to find a ton of outliers. There are major themes because universities do a really good job at collecting people who kind of have similar interests or backgrounds. Even for all the purported diversity, they tend to resemble one another. So once you have those themes, you can actually imagine those things that will begin appealing to students over time. And when you do that, you can anticipate what they're looking for better and you can create an arc of the year in your head. And the arc of the year is like, I get a group of people involved in the high holidays and the welcome week. They're gonna all drop off at the end of October. They're gonna go home and have some kind of crisis over Thanksgiving where they hate their parents, love their parents, break up with someone, hook up with someone, something will happen there. 25% will come back or disengage sometime in December. We'll get a whole bunch of new people to try and remake their life in January. There'll be a Passover or Purim thing, some Israel drama in the spring, and then everyone leaves in the fall, right? So we sort of like create an arc in our head for what's going to happen, and we imagine interventions based on that arc. So that's called the arc of development. We're trying to think of what's going to happen in the year, and that means that we allocate our organizing resources always, always at the beginning of the year, the start in January, around high holidays, and around Pesach, and sometimes Hanukkah. Jews sort of are like groundhogs, right? Like groundhogs like pop, they sort of pop their head up, right? They pop their head up at the high holidays, they pop their head up at Hanukkah, they pop their head up at Pesach, and they just disappear the rest of the time. But you can always have people pop up at those times. So you want to schedule your organizing to say, like, okay, I'm going to try and get a lot of people in the fall around high holidays. Whether or not they like to pray, I don't care. It's just that's a time when they're available and aware. It's like if we were running a fitness club, do you know when everyone joins a fitness club? Anyone know? First of the year, they all January join. Yeah. January, right? They all join in January because they have a New Year's resolution. So if you were in the fitness club business, you'd probably hire all your staff to be available in January because that's when everyone's showing up, right? So college students like not so different, right? So I would imagine we would want to do our survey for plotting the year. We're going to do our survey or our sign up at the beginning, listening tour, 
sometime October, November, have a big Hanukkah thing, and we set this out for the CEIers or the interns or whoever they are, because most kids can't actually create this for themselves. You have to line up what the arc of the year is gonna be, just like a political campaign. We're gonna have the kickoff, we're gonna have the first debate, the big fundraiser, the reveal, the October surprise, right? We're gonna take them through, and that narrative arc helps animate the community towards something, right? Um, I just wanna say two more things, and then, uh, and then we'll pause. So, when we say a narrative arc, what it means is, um, does your community this year or this period of time, is there a narrative to your community? Like, is your community trying to do something other than celebrate and be excited? And what I mean by that is like, we are working on the idea in our community, for instance, I'll make this up. Um, like, how do we coexist in a uh, multi-faith environment or something like that? Or like, how do we be religious in a really secular place? Or how do we give back to the community when we're so privileged as it is? Or how can we remember the sheer diversity? Right? I'm coming up with major dramatic questions that you can articulate in your community and be hitting as themes over and over again. Because when people feel that there's a greater arc to the community that they're trying to participate in, they get involved more. So an example would be, has anyone been to Detroit recently? Anyone ever been to Detroit? If you walk around Detroit, Michigan, everyone tells you the same thing. Oh my God, Detroit is coming back. Have you seen Detroit? It's really back. It's like so alive. I gotta tell you, Detroit's like not coming back, right? Like I've been there, but that's the narrative. And it's a great narrative. If you get the narrative in New York right now, the narrative is like, um, New York is so much more livable than it was 20 years ago. And New York is so gentrified, there's homeless people everywhere. Those are like the two narratives that everyone is like telling you. So what's the narrative of your community? And who does this really well is like Chabad. If you hang out with Chabad, there is always a narrative. The narrative is, and the narrative is always good. It's like things are growing. They're getting so big. We gave away so many pieces of chicken last week, right? Like what is the narrative of your local community? And it can be morally profound or mundane. But if you don't create the narrative and tell it to people, they will tell it to you. And the narrative they tell to you tends to be one of like how stressed they are, how the student board isn't communicating well enough. Like that's, and those are boring narratives. Like nobody cares. So give people the narrative um, that they can aspire to in their community that's actually really, really interesting that they can live up to. Let me pause right there. Questions on that? Okay, so communal narrative. Um, you might also wanna ask yourself, like when you're building that narrative, what are the um, sort of major life questions that people are dealing with? At Hunter College, um, one of the questions is, how can I become an adult when I'm still living in my parents' basement or still living at home, right? How can I move into the middle class when my parents are first generation immigrants? Can I have a normal college experience when I'm a commuter? Those are things people think about at Hunter. Um, what are the things people think about at your campus? And can you articulate them really clearly and then explain how the things that are a part of the calendar are giving them wisdom on those particular things and revisit the questions over and over and over again, right? Um, so what are the existential or thoughtful questions that embody the ethos of your campus, but at the same time allow people to revisit them over and over? I realize that's somewhat abstract. Any questions on that just before we go forward? Okay, um, a couple other things. A strategic perch, a strategic perch is where you consciously imagine a place where your community can see itself coming together. So let's say we're starting a new Hillel, right? Um, and I actually did this last year, like we started up Hunter Hillel again, and uh, completely new staff, we had 25 student names and nothing else. And like, let's say you're starting up. A strategic perch is where you go from those initial conversations, and those first events, to where you say like, Will there be a moment where everyone can feel and see that the community exists? So you might say on Hanukkah, if we had 400 people in public lighting the menorah, they would say, oh my gosh, the community is here. I can feel it. I get a sense that this thing is real. 
right? It was like in the Bernie Sanders campaign when you're in like an auditorium with like 10,000 people feeling the burn. You're like, oh, this, this like could actually happen. I get it. This is a real thing. So the strategic perch is you're always imagining a place where the community can become self-conscious, where it's not just coffee dates, but people feel like they're a part of a bigger community. You'll notice I'm using the language of the community as opposed to Jewish journeys. Like this is about how you build a community, not how you get people to feel their own interior journey. Those are different kinds of things. So how do you get the community to become self-conscious? So let's say Gavriel is like at NYU at uh, MIT and he's having lots of coffee dates and he successfully ships the calendar, starts some learning groups. The learning groups are going well. He understands the arc of the year. You might say like, look, I know people pop up for Hanukkah and they pop up for Pesach. So maybe I'm going to imagine at Hanukkah, I want there to be several hundred people getting together um, and giving light to their neighbors, so to speak, by doing a service project or laying a menorah in some place or doing some act of good work or mitzvot or something. Um, so I'm going to tell them nine weeks in advance that this is happening and constantly talk about it and project it and plan for it so that we can orchestrate the self-awareness of a community where a community begins to know itself. When we started the two bases in New York, we, um, we began organizing in, I think, November, and we set a goal that we would have 400 people come together for Purim, and we would invite all the philanthropists in the community to that event, even though we didn't know 400 people yet. Because the goal was the community needed to reach a place of self-awareness where they felt like this is a thing and it's actually possible. Um, does that make sense? Can't tell there's a, if there's just like massive zone out on the other side there in this, uh, this kind of radio silence. So anyone want to weigh in with thoughts, questions, comments, or are we just sort of like taking it in? I'm going to pause just for a little bit and wait for someone other than myself or the two usual suspects to jump in and, and offer us a question, comment, thought, or reaction. Hi, it's Gabriel over here. Um, I'm just in a loud room. That's why I'm not talking to my usual quotient. Um, but uh, I like the idea of the narrative. I think that's a, that's a really interesting idea. I noticed that our pillow doesn't really have a story. Um, and it'll be great to be able to have something we could express in one line, you know, Hillel is a place where everyone comes or like, you know, Hillel's, it's okay to be you or whatever the narrative would be outside of kind of like, you know, telling narratives through numbers, which doesn't really work so well. So I think that's a, that's a very useful piece of information. I also really like the idea of controlling the narrative and like how we explain things. I think if we don't give students the ways to, especially like our leaders, like if we don't always give them the best, you know, terminology or ideas to share, then, you know, they're just going to make up their own stuff and control their story. And, you know, we often find they're not, sometimes they're not always on the same page. Sometimes they are, sometimes they say something different than what we might want. So I really like that idea. All right. Um, so we've laid out um, a case here where you would begin organizing a community by establishing your N, your universe. You would then assign ones, twos, and threes and try and populate it with names. You would teach your staff, students, or yourself how to go out and have coffee dates with people. Coffee dates, not necessarily over coffee, but how to interact with people in order to build relationships with them and bring them into the community. While you're doing that, you're going to, in the back of your head, be constantly shipping the calendar, which is populating it with things you think people are already interested in so that when they say it, you know that you're available and ready to move on those kinds of ideas. You're imagining an arc of the year where people are gonna uh, emerge and engage more at certain times in an ebb and flow. So it's not gonna freak you out. You're just gonna know that that's happening and plan to dial up in certain places and dial down in others. As you're doing that, you're gonna imagine that you have a funnel of people where you get a lot, but they're dropping off. And so you're constantly trying to iterate or improve or modify or refine what you're doing so your funnel looks more like that and you're losing less and less people. Over the course of time, as you get people's um, thoughts and existential questions and you learn who they are much deeper, um, you can articulate what the big questions are of your community in a way that makes sense for people. Um, so like, you might say like at NYU, I haven't been at NYU in years, so I'm just making this up. You might say like, NYU is a place where people go when they think they want to make a life for themselves in New York City, right? They come from like Jersey or Long Island or wherever, and they're like, I want to live in the city, right? But what you don't realize is that when you get an apartment in the city, it's actually incredibly lonely and difficult and hard. So what NYU Hill needs to be is a place of community where people take responsibility for one another and live inspiring lives so that we can make it together in this crazy city called New York. 
I don't know, I made that up. Like that's a narrative, right? That you begin to test with people over time and see if you can do something with it. You put in all this energy so that in the second or third year that you're doing it, it becomes the inner logic of how the organization works and people begin to do it for themselves, right? They begin to imagine that Welcome Week is something, that there's always gonna be a listening tour, that you're constantly surveying and improving, that there's a narrative that's coming up each year and that we're trying to get to a place where the community can be aware of itself. And we're using language like the community and what you're doing for the community instead of your journey because we're trying to build up collectivity. We're trying to build a sense of the collective um, at all times. So let me just pause right there. Um, and that's the sort of general scope of what we're gonna do and then we're gonna try some troubleshooting um, for what we've got. So anyone wanna uh, just react to that sort of process of community building for what we've led before we do some troubleshooting? There's uh, there've been a couple of moments on the call and looking at the outline here where like, can almost feel a little bit of discomfort with this and I'm trying to figure out why. And it, it almost, I wonder if it's because we tend to approach this work usually with like this feeling that it should be organic or natural or something that like, we wanna find the students who are kind of already interested, you know, we build it, they will come kind of mentality. And this is much more strategic. And I think that like, I'm just thinking back to like, you know, my time on a, a campus Hillel before I was at SIC and like, it's a different approach, right? And the stuff that you're talking about feels like it really comes from like the sales world, the politics world, um, and is not necessarily um, inherently part of this work. And yet like, it should be obvious, like what a great approach. It feels brilliant to like look at this, but I think that there's like an uncomfortable switch maybe that has to happen. And I wonder if, um, I don't know if I'm speaking for others here or not, but like, I wonder if Dan, if you have experience like helping um, communities tell professionals um, kind of make that transition into this kind of thinking that's much more strategic, I think, than we tend to approach the work naturally. Zach, you want to weigh in on that? You're grabbing a light? Or, okay, you're just fixing a the light there? Okay. Um, look, I, I, this is one approach. Um, this is in no way needs to be your approach. So, like, take what you like, leave the rest. Uh, you don't need this. Um, you could do whatever you want to do. I'm sharing it with you because I believe deeply in what we're doing. And um, I will just, for my own person, say that I, I think that the idea of if we make something that's inspiring, people will show up. I don't think there's any evidence to support that whatsoever. I think people tend to do things because they talk to other people and they either consciously or subconsciously influence them to do things. I think there's enormous evidence that people follow what their social networks do whether that's they pick up smoking or going to the gym or voting Democratic or Republican or they're a vegan or they're gay or they're straight, whatever it is, they, they follow the social network that they're in and they choose their social network accordingly. So all I'm suggesting is strategically designing and creating the social networks as opposed to thinking that they're just going to happen on their own. Um, I'll just say one other thing, which is um, I, I'm also an unabashed evangelist. Like I believe people's lives are enhanced when they study Torah when they do mitzvot, when they participate in a Jewish community, and I want people to do that. So I'm working hard to get people to do that. Um, if people don't wanna do that, I don't judge them. I also think people's lives are enhanced when they like go outdoors and hike in nature and go to the gym, you know, like those are life enhancing things. So I'm trying actively to recruit people less than I'm trying to um, kind of build a structure and hope that they show up, if that makes sense. But do other people want to react to what Oren said? Yeah, I was thinking about that as well. And I think this is an interesting concept, like you're mentioning your background in community organizing. And I feel like part of the difference I'm seeing here is that like in organizing, like an organizer does a lot of work to put the centered population's voice in the middle. And then ultimately it's those people doing the work. And it's hard at Hillel because the centered population is the students. So I'm sort of feeling like I want to set up these models and some of the amazing ideas that you're presenting, but also like, how do we ultimately make it that like the students are the ones creating the narrative. The students are the ones doing this. Like it's for them. It's about them. It's hard to support their work. So I'm just thinking through some similar things here. Yeah. I, I tend to think that 
most of the students, uh, most of the students that we encounter are not actually capable of leading and designing and organizing their own communities. There are some that are leaders that are good, but I also think that they, they need a lot of architecting around that. And um, we can, you know, just by talking to our colleagues and our own experience, recognize that the vast majority of students tend to be looking for the same kinds of things and we can help build that for them. Um, but again, you know, it, this is just one model out there, but I'm not looking for a model um, of like total student empowerment or anything like that. I'm, I'm interested in, in creating a really powerful Jewish community and I'm agnostic uh, about whether that's led by students, staff or otherwise. I guess kind of, yeah, going off of that, I'm really absorbing a lot of this and I want to think about it. And I, and I agree this kind of model shift or thought shift because like for us and what, you know, our director often will say is like, if we don't have like at least a few students that are, you know, really invested in participating or leading or bringing their communities, that, they, that we won't be successful in what we do. Like if our staff is just like, well, well, I think students are interested in this or this is what I've heard. And then we just do it, no one shows up. But if they're invested in it and inviting their networks and like the way that we get them to invite their networks is if they feel some sort of ownership over it. That's like the only way that we've seen that that works generally. Um, like that, that's how to get those movements feeling caught in between like you know when we're talking about the staff having expertise in that obviously while also like you're saying you know social networks are super important and so kind of how do we how does that I don't know I guess it's the shift I'm just like kind of thinking about that and that kind of tension of what activates students versus like the staff and I don't know if that made sense yeah I, I think though that it's about if you're good at what you do you have an intuitive sense of what students want just like if you're like a good fashion designer, you imagine what people are going to want to wear. And if they don't like it, they're not going to put it on. Or like if you're a good party thrower, you're going to be able to throw a party that people like. Or a good rabbi, you give sermons or whatever that people are into. So you, you, it only works if you've talked to lots and lots and lots of people and you have an intuitive sense of where this is going to go. Um, so I remember I was in a conversation with one of our people the other day. And uh, it was like a three-way. It was me, one of the base rabbis, and something else. And the student said, wow, I just... It's amazing that you intuited that about me. How did you intuit that about me? So afterwards, I asked the base person, I was like, how did you intuit that about them? And I said, well, I've posted 3,000 one-on-ones over the last year. I have a very good sense of what people in this community are thinking about. Like, the moral authority comes from the work, right? Like, they, they could say that because they had talked to the people, you know? Um, so there's something to be said for, for doing that. Um, We've got a couple minutes left before we all get out of here. And I just want to ask if there's any troubleshooting at the local level that would be helpful to bring up where someone says, you know, I'm trying to do this at uh, East Lumpkin University or at Michigan or something like that. Does anyone want to offer a challenge that they're particularly facing and how we might be able to troubleshoot it together? Okay. Uh, if we don't have, then there's nothing better than free time coming back to you. I am more than happy to cede back your six minutes to you. Really thank all of you for uh, listening to me rant for 54 minutes. And uh, if you like what you heard, enjoy. If you don't, leave it here this afternoon. And we will close by just sharing with you a word about Lagba Omer. Uh, Yael, can you repost the document on Lagba Omer? So today is the 33rd day of the Omer. That starts from the second night of Pesach until Shavuot. And people tend to count these days um, with a blessing because uh, it's commanded so in the Torah for people to count them. But if you're in communities like mine, folks treat the first 33 days as like a time of mourning. So like I have this terrible haircut because I literally haven't cut my hair since before Pesach. And I've, I've managed to find excuses to shave like Israel's Independence Day and things like that. But a lot of people mourn during this time. So if you look at the Google Doc that just came up in the drive, and I recognize, like, I'm going into the world of Torah and away from community organizing now. So if you want to, like, tune out, feel free to do so. But I'm, I feel obliged to say something about Lagba Omer. Um, so if you look at the, the sources that I just shared with you, in the second source, it says that Rabbi Akiva in the time of the Talmud had 12,000 pairs of students, and they all died during this period. Because they didn't behave nicely to each other. They didn't um, act with civility, with um, with a sense of honor and with dignity uh, when interacting with each other. And all of his students died. 
and yet he was able to bring up five more students, one of whom was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And if you look at the bottom source, it describes who this student, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, was. Um, and he was an extraordinary charismat, perhaps the most charismatic of all rabbis we ever had. And he's symbolized by the image of fire. And the Torah of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai continues to this day. If you Google the word Miron, uh, you will see hundreds of thousands of people dancing around a fire, more or less in honor of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai as opposed to other things. And he symbolizes a kind of charisma. And so the question that I think about in Lagba Omer I want to leave you with is that Rabbi Akiva's students died because they weren't civil and they weren't able to be honorable and dignified to each other. And I feel like in progressive Jewish circles like my own, we're really good at um, being civil and listening to other people's voices and having a sense of cosmopolitanism and mutual trust and civil society and like safe spaces. We're really good at that. But what we're not so good at is charisma. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is a kind of incandescent, luminous charisma. But usually the people who are able to traffic in that kind of charisma are like not so tolerant, not so civil, not so interested in hearing a plurality of voices. And I feel like that's a living, abiding tension that we have in our work, which is we desperately want to create space for all the voices, and it often comes at the expense of charisma. And we desperately want to have charisma, and it usually tends to tamp down on the idea of being no hake bekavo zelaze of according each other that kind of honor. I don't have an answer for that, but that's what I'm thinking about on Lagba Omer is can we create communities um, that are both once animated by that fire of charisma and at the same time are mutually um, responsible and trusting and honorable towards each other. So just a thought for today while my kids are at a bonfire and hope you guys have uh, a wonderful, wonderful rest of your Lagba Omer and always happy to be in touch if I can give any help to the work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. I just wanted to remind everyone that the next session will be on May 22nd, and it is with Beth Cousins. If you've been in the Hello World for a while, you know how awesome Beth is, and she is definitely worth catching. She's on the 22nd, and she'll be talking about goal setting. Start with the end, imagining your impact, and it will start at 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Was there a question there? No? Awesome. Thank you. Um, and we hope to see you there. Thank you again, Dan. Thanks, everyone. Um, Have a great day. Care. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Dan.